Investing in a stronger and more secure economy. This is probably one of the most extensive group of reforms by the government based on sheer volume and so it will be split into two parts. The first is renewable technology in the environment, the second will be commercial and industrial. The meaning behind this section appears to be converting the nation's strengths into long-lasting growth, primarily through refining our natural minerals and making use of renewable power. Categories here include renewable energy, powering net zero industries and jobs, environmental policies and disaster resilience. Renewable energy. Biggest argument against renewables is the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. This is wrong. Somewhere in the world the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. All we need to keep harvesting it is a big enough grid that can draw power from anywhere. The Australian government plans on making it. $12 billion of its $20 billion investment in rewiring the nation will be spent on transformational transmission projects, putting its grid on track to becoming 82% renewable by 2030. Upgrading the systems responsible for transmission will allow the reliable use of multiple sources of power, which is vital to using renewable technology. Power production is one thing, but making sure that power is distributed and stored in such a way that everyone can constantly use the power requires some heavy infrastructure. The government is spending $12 billion to secure the electricity grid. What kind of things can you get done with that budget? For starters, $1 billion of low-cost debt loans was invested in Tasmania's Battery of the Nation project, which will use hydropower in places like Lake Kethana to store energy. $1.5 billion will also be seen for Victorian Renewable Energy Zones, RES, and offshore wind. Renewable Energy Zones are areas determined to be most ideal for building renewables on, a bit like planetary features in Stellaris. On top of that, $4.7 billion will unlock critical transmission and RES in New South Wales, including plugging in Snowy 2.0. Other examples include the Hunter Transmission Project, where the uniquely potent renewable sources and existing mining infrastructure could see massive investment in green industry. All these projects will be linked by massive electricity interconnectors like the Marinus Link, which is a $3 billion wire planned to connect Tasmania and Victoria. Turning power on and off at a whim is much harder on a nationwide scale, but this new scheme will make it possible. The capacity investment scheme will tend to the delivery of renewable generation and storage to the southeastern states to unlock $10 billion of new investment. The government wishes to increase the amount of power that can be turned on and off on demand, known as dispatchable power, by offering to underwrite, essentially take risk for, investors to build dispatchable renewable sources like grid batteries. A desire to prevent the 2022 winter energy crisis caused by the Liberal government failing to maintain in the grid, allowing 4 gigawatt dispatchable power grid to be replaced with a 1 gigawatt power grid, along with just modernising the Australian energy grid, are the known motivators behind this initiative. This is just one of the hundreds of complementary power projects fallen into place nationwide, and it's an amazing sight to see. There are two ways to decrease carbon usage, increasing renewable energy usage and decreasing general power usage. The government is doing a lot to make renewables, but also has some neat carrots to help you or your business make the most of it. $1.3 billion is allocated to a household energy upgrades fund, which will provide cheap loans to houses for various energy saving projects like solar and more efficient appliances. For businesses with under $50 million turnover, $310 million will also be invested to give tax deductions for upgrading their electrical systems efficiency through the small business energy incentives. The max claim is 20% tax off any assets related to improving energy efficiency and can be up to $100,000 of cost, potentially saving $20,000. This is predicted to affect 3.8 million businesses and apply to all upgrades used or installed until the 30th of June 2024. There is now a proper plan to get Australians to adopt and afford electric cars. This part of this plan is a national electric vehicle strategy which intends to outline a broad idea for adopting electric cars. This strategy contains three objectives, increase supply of affordable EVs, establish EV infrastructure Structure and encourage EV demand. The first policy enacted under this strategy is $7.4 million to support fuel efficiency standards designed to encourage the supply of more EVs. $7.8 million for the Transport and Infrastructure Net Zero Roadmap and Action Plan, organising the many changes to how emissions can be reduced in transport, including alternative fuel, new technology and improved infrastructure like rail, something that was unsurprisingly welcomed by the Australasian Railway Association. Powering net zero industries and jobs. What is the future of fuel in Australia? The $2 billion Hydrogen Head Start program will support large-scale renewable hydrogen projects through competitive contracts. Hydrogen is a renewable combustible fuel that can be used for industrial heat, heavy transport fuel and potentially manufacturing purposes. Contracts for two to three flagship projects, including $2 million for Indigenous consultation support, will have the goal of providing one gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity and build on the basis for the hydrogen industry to expand 
expand further. It has become more difficult to invest in renewables in Australia due to the US increasing their competition and taking away the expertise and investors needed for the cutting edge projects. $38.2 million will be spent to establish a guarantee origin scheme which will reliably track where emissions come from. Australia plans on becoming a renewable energy superpower by manufacturing their own technology. But how are they going to get the minerals for it? $57.1 million will be spent to develop the Critical Minerals International Partnership Program, working with countries like the US, Japan and others. This will advance mineral sciences, sustainable practice and address risks to supply chains, which is seen from the pandemic and cause devastation to productivity when disrupted. This program secures all the necessary resources to build a renewable manufacturing industry with a $2 billion critical minerals facility and $15 billion national reconstruction fund. The country will soon be able to sustain even major economic disruption and still keep growing. As the world's number one producer of lithium and titanium, the second largest producer of zircon and top five producer of other rare earth minerals, this partnership program also secure the renewable energy future for all countries involved. How are Australia's small businesses supposed to capitalise on the renewable energy boom? The new federal budget outlined $14.8 million to establish something called the Powering Australia Industry Growth Centre. Designed to support businesses in making, commercialising or adopting renewables. Industry growth centres are not-for-profit organisations led by experts in industry trying to lead cultural change in the sector. This growth centre will get minerals, producers and renewables manufacturers rubbing shoulders. Additionally, $3 billion is allocated to investments on low emission tech like green metals under the National Reconstruction Fund. All these policies come in the context of strong competition with the American government whose administration's Inflation Reduction Act has stolen many renewable investors from spending their resources and expertise in our country. Will Australia make up for lost time to become the renewable energy superpower it dreams to be? Only time will tell. Will Australia compete with America's record investment in renewable energy? $5.6 million will be used to analyse new implications of the increased competitiveness of renewable energy for Australia and ways to find new opportunities. The world is at a critical point in renewable energy industry and Australia has all the necessary components to become a renewable energy superpower. But with the USA still and all the investors and expertise, along with a wasted decade under the previous gas bag government, it's not clear if Australia can become the power of its dreams. The government is going full war economy to reach its renewable energy targets. Just like in the war days, $8.3 million will be spent over four years to develop and issue green bonds. Often issued by the government, bonds are bought by investors with the promise that they will be paid back by the issuer in the future with interest. These green bonds are designed to raise money for investing in renewable projects to get the country to net zero emissions. Additionally, in an echo of the war era stock taken of the curtain period, $1.6 million is being spent to co-fund with private companies the Australian Sustainable Finance Taxonomy, which is essentially a list that defines all the economic activities that count as sustainable. Companies lying about their environmental friendliness seems like an everyday occurrence, soon could be a thing of the past. The Commonwealth is moving $4.3 million to bolster ASIC enforcement against greenwashing in order to remain competitive in global capital markets. Greenwashing is when a company overstated its environmental friendliness. ASIC is already enforced against multiple superannuation companies, with one of the largest being against Mercer Superannuation, whose sustainable plan that claimed to not invest in fossil fuels had money invested in 15 different fossil fuel companies companies from Whitehaven Coal to BHP. Finally, no more companies of names like Evil Planet Burner LTD claim to be carbon neutral. The government rushed the Governor General to establish a new executive called the Net Zero Authority. Focusing on regions and industry, this new agency will be composed of an independent chair and supported by an advisory board. It is responsible for promoting an orderly and effective transformation of net zero emissions that allows communities most affected to not get left behind in the rush of the world's greatest boom since the Industrial Revolution. Workers in emission intensive sectors will get access to new skills and support to help them transition to a different sector. Regions will get extra programs programs to ensure industries in their areas will benefit them and investors and companies will be supported to better engage with projects related to net zero. The government will be using the Power in the Regions Fund to populate the regions and turn them into an unshakable superpower. Core to the Powering Regions Fund is reducing emissions in regional areas using a special net zero economy task force. Existing industries like mining will be made more carbon neutral and have the generated wealth feed back into the towns that made them, turning the country from a desolate seven city backwater into a booming continent wide federation and world power. The government is still nailing out how exactly it will use the Powering the Regions Fund 
plant to build up the regions, but complementing it already includes massive regional projects like hydrogen hubs create clean fuel and the Northern Australia infrastructure facility to ensure the things built in the region suffer no funding delays. Environmental policies, a sustainable future. Beyond just focusing on renewable energy, the government has also outlined new policies relating to the actual environment itself. The stated reason behind these policies is that Australia's natural environment offers economic benefits and is of unique cultural and heritage value. The murray Darling Basin, Australia's largest and most complex river system, will have over $103 million pumped into sustaining this million square kilometre water network through re reviewing the murray Darling Basin Plan. Droughts and increasing human use made the need to manage the basin's water use in line with the Water Act of 2007 more pertinent. So the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was enacted by the 2012 Gillard Labor Government and followed through by the affected states. Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek says the plan has been sabotaged by the previous Liberal National Government, a statement reflected by journalists like Michael West, noting insufficient requirements for managing the Northern Basin Plan in 2017, and the documentary Blood Water by YouTuber-friendly Geordies, who placed much of the blame for the basin Basin's troubles on the New South Wales National Party. With their new investment in the plan's review, the government aims to both update the plan to change in the basin's conditions and ensure the use of climate change policy, scientific understanding and indigenous knowledge. In 2022, though, your government released a nature positive plan. This plan was based on a simple premise. If our laws don't change, our trajectory of environmental decline will not change either. Based on a report by Graham Samuel AC, it was intended to improve environmental protections, get departments dependent on environment decisions, and make doing the right thing easier. The new budget has moved the plan further, $121 million to establish Environmental Protections Australia and $51 million to establish Environment Information Australia. Environment Protection Australia will serve like an environmental protection agency. Independent and bound to transparency, it will make assessments approvals and conditions relating to the environment. According to Mirage News, new laws being negotiated will enhance the new agency's powers in preventing biodiversity loss. Environment Information Australia will be a data body which will provide quality information about the environment with the intent to be used in regulation planning and reporting. Australia is large and diverse, which means it has a lot of national parks. According to Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek, however, they have been neglected under the previous government, with programs to protect threatened species, protect native animals and maintain infrastructure all suffering this management. The federal government has outlined a total of $355.1 million to address chronic underfunding of national parks. With special mention being given to Kakadu, where a range of stations are falling apart, and Uluru Kadaduja, where basic shade and housing facilities are highly inadequate. Disaster resilience. Natural disasters have devastated Australia from the get-go, but they have reached near unfathomable scales in recent years, with by far the most notable disaster being the 2019 bushfires, whose memory only fades with the pandemic that came after. $200 million will be moved to a disaster ready fund to support disaster relief projects. This fund will be made available to state and territory governments and involve partnership with local councils. Projects can include improving drainage to reduce flood risks, data sharing initiatives to better communicate and predict when events occur, and fire breaks in evacuation centres to reduce the damage when bushfire season begins. A lot more needs to be done and is being done to reduce the impact of Australia's increasing natural disasters. Nevertheless, this fund goes a long way in ensuring disasters like the 2019 Bush fires from the 2021-22 Queensland floods don't do the scale of damage that they did in the past. Does a government ever apologise for the actions of its previous regime? It's not common, but in the case of Australia, they kind of have. The 2019 bushfires was one of the worst fires in world history and it saw the Prime Minister who defunded the services meant to prevent and manage them take an holiday in Hawaii when hell literally broke loose. Come election time and he inevitably lost to a far more pro not letting houses burn down leader named Anthony Albanese. In the 2023-24 federal budget he allocated $8.4 billion over five years to reimburse states for past disasters to make amends for the previous government's complete inaction. This was on top of billions of dollars in 2022 for a disaster recovery allowance going directly to those still affected by natural disasters. It's a rare and pretty sight to see a government own up to the mistakes of its predecessors, but Australia shows that once in a red smoking moon, it is possible.